Sask Party MLA caught up in human trafficking probe as he seeks sexual services. Six senior executives are fired as the Alberta government dismantles the Alberta Health Service. A teacher alleges he was racially profiled, beaten by police at the Edmonton airport. A crack emerges in the two Michaels block and bad news for Argentina as the worst man in the world is elected president. Good morning. It's Monday, November 20th. I'm Nora. Here are your headlines. We start in the theocracy known as Saskatchewan. After months and months and months of attacking trans children to try and whip bigots into voting for the Sask party, a member of their party was just caught up in charges related to human trafficking. Ryan Domitar is the MLA from Cutknife Turtleford. He's 56 years old and been around politics for a long time. Josh Lynn from CTV News reports that Domitar has been arrested, quote, following a prostitution-related charge, unquote. Now, no one should care if Domitar pays for sex, and Canada's prostitution laws need to be struck down. But this also shouldn't fall out of the news. He was part of a sweep that was, quote, combating sexual exploitation and human trafficking, unquote. Was he paying for sex from someone who was working free of coercion and duress? As a politician, he's a man who likes power, and I'd be watching to see what kind of information comes out next about the fella or about what kind of probe this was, because of course, that also could have just been a name used to harass sex workers. 16 others were arrested in the same investigation. Of course, Puritan Scott Moe kicked him out of caucus. Next to Alberta, where six senior executives with the province's health services agency, the AHS, have been fired, including Moro Chias, who was just appointed a couple of months ago as CEO. The news came just eight days after the government appointed a new board of directors. The unbylined article from CBC News says that Premier Daniel Smith announced plans to dismantle the AHS and turn it into four service delivery groups. Those groups would report directly to Health Minister Adriana Lagrange. This will make the this will, of course, bring health services closer to partisan politics than it was when it was its own agency. And you don't need to look too far to see evidence of this. The new chair of the board of the AHS will be Lyle Oberg, a former cabinet minister with the PC government. The AHS will still exist, but will be in a quote-unquote diminished capacity. Out of their roles as vice presidents are Francois Belanger and Colleen Purdy. Tina Giesbrecht, who was general counsel, is also out, as are Jeffrey Pradella and Dean Olmsted. They were both senior administrators. The AHS didn't answer CBC's questions. Now, let's stay in Alberta. Chrislaine Kenfak, a teacher and resident of Gatineau, alleges that he was racially profiled at the Edmonton airport. Last April, Kenfak flew with his two children from Edmonton to Ottawa. At the airport, he was subjected to additional security screening, first a more intense and invasive pat-down, which he felt humiliated by, and then he was taken to a private screening room and searched again. The secondary search caused Kenfak to miss his flight. Police arrived when Kenfak was trying to figure out what to do about his missed flight with a Katza agent. As he begged them to help him out, police told him that he should either leave the airport or be arrested. They said racist comments to him and then brought him to the ground and handcuffed him. He struggled to breathe due to the force of the arrest, CBC reports. This whole experience happened in front of his two children, aged 2 and 10. He was then placed in a wheelchair and brought to the RCMP office at the airport, where he was arrested, after he went to the hospital to be seen for injuries to his knees, wrists, and neck. Kenfak has lodged a complaint with the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission and the Canadian Human Rights Commission against the security and police staff at the airport. Now, as someone who flies a lot, I could not imagine how I would melt down if this happened to me. I really sympathize with Kenfak here. A missed flight because of bigoted decision from security officials would send me into a rage, and it must have been so traumatic for him and for his children to watch. Kenfak is an expert in human rights and racism. He was a postdoc at the University of Alberta, and he leads anti-racism workshops. 
He immigrated to Canada from Cameroon in 2019. He is being helped by the Montreal-based group La Coalition Rouge, a group that advocates for people who experience police or state violence and brutality. Next to probably the biggest news of the weekend, which you may have seen or maybe you didn't because maybe you don't read the news on weekends, which good for you. The Globe and Mail broke the news that there is a crack in the two Michaels block. Michael Spavor is suing the federal government, alleging that comments he made to Michael Kovrig about his work made it back to the Five Eyes partners through Kovrig. That information was what China considered to be intelligence and what landed Spavor in prison. Recall that we never heard much from Spavor over the years that they were detained. Most of the information about the detainees, the detention in general, how they were doing, came from Michael Kovrig and his family members, in particular, his ex-wife. But Spavor was pretty quiet. In fact, I don't think we heard more than a few times from Spavor over the course of the detention. Both men were detained for more than 1,000 days. In a CTV report seeking comment from Global Affairs Canada, Michael Lee reports that Global Affairs Canada is, quote, dismissing the idea unquote, of Spavor's take on the situation. The article is written in a funny way that this is all just, quote unquote, an idea and not something that one of the two Michaels is alleging. Global Affairs accused Spavor of towing China's line by explaining how he isn't a spy and got caught up in this whole affair. Here is comment from Pierre Cuguin from Global Affairs Canada. Quote, perpetuating the notion that either Michael was involved in espionage is only perpetuating a false narrative under which they were detained by China. Unquote. Lee makes the point that the comment is very similar to what they said to the Globe and Mail. Kugoin's quote continues, saying, These two men went through an unbelievably difficult ordeal, and every day of their arbitrary detention showed strength, perseverance, resilience, and grace. They inspired all Canadians as a country. We breathed a collective sigh of relief when they returned home, unquote. Now, let's keep in mind that the narrative here that Global Affairs Canada is trying to maintain underpins the entire reason behind their detention, and that if this unravels, there are so many other questions that Canadian officials must answer for. Global Affairs is really hoping we forget that it's literally one of the Michaels making these allegations, that accusing Michael Kovrig of being a spy is not something that China is doing in this case, but is in fact something that Michael Spavor is doing. The whole blame China for everything thing doesn't work when it's coming from within the Michaels block. Lee helpfully reminds us that the two men were, quote, often referred to as the two Michaels, unquote, which is a genuinely funny factoid tacked on to the end of this article. Were they called that or were they simply two Michaels? And maybe Lee feels a particular fondness for them as he's also named Michael. Anyway, they were released in September 2021, the same day that the Americans agreed to not charge Meng Wanzhou, who Canada had arrested and held after she transited through the Vancouver airport. Meng is a high-ranking Huawei official and the daughter of the head of Huawei. Of course, this lawsuit pokes holes in the government's claim that their arrest was random and that they absolutely weren't spies and had nothing to do with Meng's detention and that Canada was just following the rule of law. I'm so excited to hear more. And finally, to very bad news for Argentina. You'll remember from the Daily News podcast that Argentina had a runoff ballot to elect their new president. Well, proto-fascist Javier Millet has won. Millet won with 55% of the votes as of last night, with 94% of votes counted, reports CNN. Sergio Massa conceded. Millet has terrible hair and was a former TV pundit. He's promised to adopt the U.S. dollar in Argentina, something that no country as large as Argentina has done. That will be, well, oof. Is no one in the far right in Argentina paying attention to the decline of the U.S. empire? (laughs) Is now the time that you want to take on their currency? Isn't that a potential disaster? (laughs) Anyway, Millet hates abortions, but judging by his vibe, he's probably paid for a few over his lifetime. He says that climate change is, quote, a lie of socialism, unquote, and he's promised to close Argentina's ministries of culture, education, and diversity to save money. And side note, back when I was in university studying public policy, I had one assignment where I had to take a ministry's budget and cut 15% out of it. I picked the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines, and I cut the mines section entirely 
entirely, which reduced the overall budget by 25%. I added some more money into Northern Development. That was a silly protest stunt over a ridiculous assignment. And wow, someone in an actual government is proposing to do exactly this. Amazing. Millet also wants to turn Argentina's prisons over to the military to control and get rid of gun control regulations. He wants to privatize health care, which in Argentina has always been public. Back in 2017, Millet called the Pope the, quote, son of Satan. Good luck, Argentina. Those are your headlines for Monday, November 20th. I'm Nora. You are listening to this podcast at sandyandnora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed or anywhere you get your podcasts. I hope you have a wonderful Monday and I'll talk to you tomorrow.